For this video, we're going to look at topic 5.3, Mendelian genetics. Gregor Mendel was born in 1822. Thanks to his work in the mid-1800s experimenting on pea plants between 1856 and 1863, he established many of the rules of heredity that form the basis for the modern-day field of genetics. The significance of Mendel's work was not truly recognized until the beginning of the 20th century, nearly 20 years after his death. Although much more about genetics and inheritance patterns has been learned since then, his work is still relevant today. Mendel knew nothing about the contents of a cell's nucleus, its DNA, or its connection to a related nucleic acid, RNA. But when those molecules were discovered, the significance of Mendel's work provided important context about an organism's genetic information and the characteristics that arise from it. In order to understand some of the concepts within genetics, a basic understanding of probability is required. The mathematics of probability allow us to make predictions about the possible outcomes of given events, such as the creation of offspring in a sexually reproducing species. Specifically, there are two important laws of probability that relate to genetics. The first states that for any set of mutually exclusive events, the probability of either of those two events occurring are added together. Consider a six-sided die. The probability of rolling a two is one-sixth. The probability of rolling a two or a five is one-sixth plus one-sixth, one-third. The second important aspect of probability involves the likelihood of two independent events occurring together. In this case, the individual probabilities of those events are multiplied. Therefore, the probability of rolling a 2 and a 5 would be 1 sixth times 1 sixth, equaling 1 36th. Here's another example. Consider this penny. The probability of flipping heads is 1 half. For this nickel, the probability of flipping heads is also 1 half. But were you to flip the penny and the nickel, the probability of heads on both coins is one quarter, just as the probability of heads on the penny and tails on the nickel, or tails on the penny and heads on the nickel, or tails on both coins. Mendel presented his paper, Experiments on Plant Hybridization, in 1865. Mendel's three laws of heredity were largely ignored by the scientific community, because it was seen as essentially about plant hybridization rather than inheritance patterns. Quite simply, others did not understand the monumental significance of Mendel's discoveries. The first of Mendel's laws is called the law of dominance. It states that given two different alleles in a diploid organism, only the dominant allele plays a role in the organism's resultant characteristics. Mendel found this to be true because the offspring of true breeding parents would display the trait of only one of the parents, the one with the dominant characteristic, 100% of the time. Mendel's second law relates to the probability of passing on a given allele from heterozygous individuals in the F1 generation. The heterozygous F1 individuals produce two kinds of gamete. 50% of the time containing a dominant allele, and 50% of the time the recessive one. This is Mendel's law of segregation. It states that meiosis separates the alleles that an individual has into different gametes. Additionally, the alleles for a trait found on separate chromosomes will be separated into different gametes. This dihybrid cross illustrates both the law of segregation and the importance of probability. The F1 generation individuals are heterozygous for both P color and P shape. Therefore, the possible gametic combination of alleles are such that there is a 25% chance of a gamete containing both dominant alleles, 25% chance of the recessive and dominant shape alleles, 
a 25% chance of the dominant color but the recessive shape allele, and a 25% chance of both recessive alleles. Mendel's third law is the law of independent assortment. This law states that the alleles for separate traits on non-homologous chromosomes are passed independently of one another during gamete formation. That is to say, the probability of passing on an allele for one trait has nothing to do with the selection of an allele for any other trait on a different chromosome. Why this is true is entirely thanks to what occurs in meiosis during metaphase 1. During this stage, pairs of chromosomes are aligned on the cell's equator such that one half of each pair is on either side of the equator. This diagram models a cell with two pairs of chromosomes. The manner in which the larger pair is aligned does not in any way influence the arrangement of the smaller pair. Now, consider a human cell with 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each pair aligning on the cell's equator is independent of all the others. This means that there are 2 to the 23rd possible arrangements of chromosomes at metaphase 1, resulting in nearly 8.4 million combinations. After gametes are created, being haploid with only one set of chromosomes, fertilization joins together a sperm cell and an egg cell to form a diploid zygote. Each gamete contributes a portion of that zygote's genetic information. From the sperm cell, 22 autosomes and one of the sex chromosomes. The egg provides another 22 autosomes and an X chromosome. Additionally from the egg, a zygote receives nearly all of its cytoplasm and organelles from the egg. This means that extra nuclear genetic information such as that found within mitochondria and chloroplasts, are passed exclusively from mother to offspring. The genetic information the zygote possesses is acted upon, resulting in an organism's characteristics. In other words, genotype influences phenotype. Oftentimes, phenotype is oversimplified to mean an organism's physical characteristics. While this is true, it is incomplete since an organism's phenotype also includes developmental processes as the organism grows and progresses through its life cycle. It also incorporates biochemical processes such as cellular respiration and photosynthesis, and other aspects of physiological processes. Phenotype is even used to describe an animal's behavior. Perhaps one of the most useful and ubiquitous diagrams used in studying genetics is the Punnett square. The British geneticist Reginald Punnett devised this approach in 1905 for modeling the probability of an offspring having a particular genotype. Monohybrid crosses are used to demonstrate the probability, given the genotypes of two parents, that offspring will receive a particular genotype. This model shows that two heterozygous parents will produce a homozygous dominant offspring 25% of the time, a homozygous recessive offspring 25% of the time, and a heterozygous offspring half of the time. But thanks to Mendel's law of dominance, we know that the phenotypic ratio will be 3 to 1. Three dominant yellow for every one recessive green. Dihybrid crosses allow us to model the inheritance pattern of two genes. This Punnett square that we saw earlier shows the resulting probabilities given two parents that are heterozygous for two traits. The variety of possible genotypes results in a characteristic phenotypic ratio. Out of 16, nine individuals with the dominant color and dominant shape three with the dominant color but the recessive shape, three with the recessive color and the dominant shape, and one with both recessive traits. A 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. A second type of modeling diagram, pedigrees, are essentially family trees that are useful in tracking the inheritance of a particular trait within that family. 
whether a trait is the result of a dominant allele or a recessive one, or if the gene is located on an autosome or a sex chromosome, will yield particular patterns in the pedigree. Feel free to pause the video here for a moment if you'd like the opportunity to view this diagram a bit longer. Although the vast majority of genes are found within the autosomes of an organism, there are unique patterns of inheritance that arise for genes found on sex chromosomes. We generally limit our study of sex-linked inheritance to the X chromosome and the genes it carries since the Y chromosome with its genes are found exclusively within biological males. A genetic consequence of males possessing only one of each sex chromosome means that he will display the phenotype for the single allele he carries. In other words, if a male has a dominant allele for a gene on the X chromosome, he will display the dominant phenotype, since it has no other influences on it. On the other hand, if he has a recessive allele for a gene on the X chromosome, he will exhibit the recessive phenotype. Observe these diagrams. On the left is the inheritance pattern that would result from these hypothetical parents if an X-linked gene is the result of a dominant allele. Since the father is unaffected, he has no true influence on the phenotype of his hypothetical children. But this particular mother, being heterozygous for a dominant X-linked gene, has a 50% chance of passing on that dominant allele to her offspring, regardless of their biological sex. When an X-linked gene is recessive, on the other hand, the pattern of inheritance differs, as is illustrated on the right. In this case, the hypothetical father also has no influence on the potential children for this gene, but the mother, being a carrier, she does. A carrier is an individual who does not display the recessive phenotype, but because they carry a recessive allele, they can pass it on. If she passes on the dominant allele, the children are unaffected, regardless of their biological sex. This is not the case if the recessive allele is passed on. Passing on the recessive allele to a female offspring produces another carrier. A male child who receives the recessive allele will display the recessive phenotype. Classic examples of X-linked recessive disorders include colorblindness and hemophilia. Understanding sex-linked inheritance patterns of recessive traits explains why it is always more common for males to have X-linked recessive disorders. And that concludes topic 5.3. Thank you for watching. Take care.